Our next speaker is Dr. Marie Corcoran, who is an adjunct research fellow at James Cook University in Townsville. And Marie's talk is going to be about the um, neoproterozoic reef system at Akarula. So we'll follow on uh, the topic of Akarula. Thanks, Marie. Well, firstly, um, I'd like to thank the survey for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, there were times in Earth history when our small blue planet wasn't quite so blue. In the cryogenian, it looked a little bit more like this. Twice, in fact. So, during the cryogenian, there were two intervals of global-scale glaciation that extended ice coverage over all latitudes of the Earth. They lasted for about 10 million years. Or in, they lasted for tens of millions of years, I should say, and pro profoundly impacted Earth's atmospheric, lithospheric, uh, hydrologic and biospheric systems. The first of the glaciations is most commonly referred to... I'm just going to get this to work. There we go. It's most co commonly referred to as the Sturdian glaciation, and it initiated around about 716 million years ago, uh, extending to about 658 million years. The second of these gla glaciations is co uh, generally referred to as the Maranoan glaciation, which initiated sometime before 639 and extending to the base of the Ediacaran at about 635.5 million years. In South Australia, the Flinders Ranges is richly endowed with arguably the world's <coughs> best inventory of geological evidence of these events. Not only are the glaciations superbly preserved by multiple tillites, and in the South Australian context, they're referred to as the Sturt Glaciation and the Alatna Glaciation, but the interglacial period between these glacial events uh, pre preserves a continuous succession um, of uh, uh, of equally interesting um, biological events. Um, <clears throat> so the story of uh, this interglacial period is really well preserved in the basin sediments and the rifted margins of the Adelaide um, Rift Complex. So the cryogenian records other globally significant events, including the second of the great atmospheric oxygenation events known as the Neoproterozoic oxygenation event. Uh, so during this time, the Earth's um, atmosphere, the ox oxygen levels in the Earth's atmosphere began to appro um, approach um, the atmosp present atmospheric levels. <clears throat> so the uh, figure on the left, on the right hand side, yeah, the right hand side here, <laughs> whoops, I'm just going to go back one. No, you can't go back. Um, on the right-hand side, let me get this right, organised, um, shows this second step in uh, um, Earth atmospheric oxygenation that's coincident with this within the cryogenian period and is also indicative of things that were happening biologically, atmospherically, tectonically um, and climatically during this, during this time. So there was a lot going on and it all sets the scene for the... Um, emergence of uh, complex life that we first start seeing during the Ediacaran period. <clears throat> so there was an interaction of um, a range of things happening in the cryogenian that we're aware of, but we're not really um, familiar, we still haven't really unraveled the, core, the mechanistic cause and effect um, of a lot of these, um, it, these events, and, and there's, a, there's a whole world of scope of investigating what was really going on in the cryogenian. One of the evolutionary stories that um, is emerging in the cryogenian non-interglacial this period, the non-interglacial period, is that of increasing um, complexity of carbonate stromatolite, or carbonate reefs, and their reef building frameworks. Um, there's, a, there's only a small number of neoproterozoic reefs that are well documented worldwide, um, and so the evidence from the cryogenian reefs in the Adelaidean, uh, in the Adelaide Rift complex, is of global significance. So <clears throat> ecological reefs are those that are rigid with a constructional framework and they're wave resistant. And over deep time, they record um, a profound ecological differences in primary framework builders. We may be familiar with the transition of reef, reef systems from archaeocyathid, wrong button, from archaeocyathid through to um, non-scleric corals, rugose 
um, rugose reefs and stromatoporoid reefs through to the modern sclerotinian reef systems that we might be more familiar with of our, our coral reef systems. <clears throat> In the Proterozoic, we associate uh, reef forming structures with stromatolites. Um, this is an example from um, a reef system in, in the Kimberley region. But up until now, we haven't really considered the role of these reef building um, organisms um, in the same sort of way that we, we, we think about ecosystems <coughs> associated with reefs in the Phanerozoic. So it turns out that um, the Cryogenian, non-glacial period, was a time of pro prolific stromatolite growth in South Australia and in the northern Flinders Ranges, we are left with spectacular evidence of warm water carbonate stromatolite reefs that make up the Balkanuna formation. The preservation and exposure of these reefs gives us an unparalleled opportunity to investigate in detail cryogenian reef frameworks and whether there um, is a, a stromatolite association which is analogous to Phanerozoic reef building ecosystems. That is, are they responsive to the physico-chemical um, controls that we um, uh, observe in the Phanerozoic? So it's actually really con um, intriguing that despite the profound um, temporal diversity in seawater chemistry, atmospheric conditions and biological evolution throughout the Phanerozoic, um, that both ancient and modern reef structures appear to be composed of broadly similar geomorphological and architectural elements. And the question is, can the same be said for reef builders of the um, Proterozoic? So I'm just going to give you a quick little primer on what strom um, stromatolites are, um, just to remind you. So stromatolites are um, organosedimentary structures. Uh, they're, they're actually communities that comprise predominantly of photosynthetic cyanobacteria. They also include archaea, pro um, prokaryotes and eukaryotic microbiota. So the conventional um, way that we think that stromatolites form is through trapping and binding of sediment by cyanobacterial filaments, but a more contemporary way of thinking about their formation is that of um, microbial me mediation of carbonates um, in, in laminated um, structures that are grayed with time to produce the thermal structures that we might be familiar with. So that microbial mediation can um, occur either on filament surfaces or can replace uh, organic matter or, or it can precipitate on and in um, complex organic frameworks. So a really vexatious question about stromatolites and how they form is what controls their morphology? So uh, is it environmental? Is it um, environmental drivers or controls such as hydrology, so the energy regime, the water chemistry, the nutrient content, water depth and light, and other um, um, sedimentological aspects that controls their shape? Um, or, more controversially, um, uh, does the microbial consortia itself control uh, the structure and morphology of stromatolites? So the question is, does morphology represent a sort of taxonomic entity? And um, the question about this environment versus evolution is something that's still unresolved um, and, as I said, a little bit contentious. So there's really nowhere better to study cryogenian reefs than here in the northern Flinders Ranges at Akarula, on the north northeastern margin of the Adelaide Rift Complex. So um, in Akarula and in the Gammon Ranges, get the right button, all right. Um, the reefs reefs dominate the carbonate formation that uh, the carbonate rocks of the Balkanuna formation, which is shown here in orange. So um, the sort of structures that I'll be focusing on today are. Um, uh, situated in, on um, Akarula in, in an incising gorge on Kings Mill Creek. So um, this, this um, location affords us really excellent exposure in three dimensions of the reef structures. So through field mapping and um, FASI's analysis, I've developed a schema of about 10 um, biogenic and sedimentological FASI's which characterise the reef. And from their field relationships, um, I've been able to sort of group them into four associations which are associated with sub-environments across the reef. And the terms of those associations are across, uh, across the top here, sorry, wrong button, across the top here. Um, and they might be sub-environments that you will be more familiar with from, uh, from Phanerozoic reefs. Uh, so just to explain the um, symbology on this figure, the size of the, the circles represents the relative abundance of each of the 
these fasces within the fasces associations. Um, and the colours refer to whether the fasces are predominantly biogenic, so um, the blue represents biogenic, or whether they're predominantly mechanically deposited fasces, which is the yellow, and the green represents fasces that are a combination of both those sorts of processes. So the FASI scheme has been put together into a three-dimensional interpretive model that shows the geometry and the architectural elements of the reef um, and the spatial distribution of the four sub-reef environments um, is a response to the prevailing energy regime that was controlling the reef as it, grow, as it grew. So the four reef in environment... Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm a slow learner. The four reef environment um, faces the prevailing wind and wave which is um, coming from the right, from your right um, on the slide. And um, the, the four reef itself is uh, dominated by um, mechanically deposited and gravity fed deposits that fall off the slope, the front slope of the reef, um, and also by these um, large scale uh, domal stromatolites, which form the, the basis of the, um, the reef framework. A reef crest develops. Uh, close to sea level, the top here, and um, that acts, to, acts as a um, robust sort of um, buffering system that decreases the energy as it moves over the, reefs, over the reef system um, and into the decreasing the energy across here on the um, reef flat where a more open framework, framework structure of um, stromatolite morphology is observed. And then as we come off the reef flat, um, actually towards the back of the reef flat and the, the leeward part of the reef flat, the energy system is dominated more by tidal processes. And so, again, the morphology of the stromatolites we see there is modified. Um, into the back reef lagoon, the mechanically uh, deposited, uh, abraded and re reworked and deposited material is deposited as sandy shoals in the back reef. And we see also microbial development in that back back reef lagoon area that um, develops into patch reef structures. So just to give you a little bit of a tour of the rocks that represent these fasces, um, I'll do this relatively quickly. Um, so in the four reef, the four reef slope environment, um, we see these gravity fed deposits that are um, dominated by uh, Breccia bound stones. And, and it's a little bit hard to see at this resolution, but the, there are a lot of limestone, angular limestone class that are bound, uh, so they're the dark grey class that, in here, that are bound by um, the orangey coloured material, or matrix, which is actually a microbial, microbial mat. Um, and these deposits are sometimes overlaid by encrusting microbial boundstone, which, which encrusts and drapes over these uh, debris deposits. And um, these, these deposits are heterogeneously deposited across the front of the reef. So we don't see them as continuous. They're more um, len well, lenticular. Uh, yeah, they're, they're discontinuously uh, deposited across as you walk along the basal contact of the reef. Um, also in the four reef setting are these large domal structures that I referred to before. Um, so they occur on really large scales, like metre scale um, dimensions, and they form, they grow in stacked um, quite, quite relatively compact stacked uh, bioherms that are grayed and form the core of the reef and are grayed upwards. As we move towards the top of the reef to the um, reef crest, these same domal stromatolites, so they have the same, the same fabric as the stromatolites that we see at the, in the four reef slope, um, continue to the reef crest but the dimensions of these stromatolites decrease so they become more compact um, and of smaller scale. And they form a bus, buttressed and rope, um, more robust structure that uh, modifies the local hydrological conditions. Uh, so then as we move into the reef flat setting, um, the association of stromatolites there is dominated much more by columnar and branching style stromatolites. So these, um, these forms, as I said, are much more open and they um, act to baffle sediment and, um, and trap, trap sediment within that environment. And the the dimensions of these stromatolites are more on the centimetre scale, so the columns are often around about five centimetres in diameter, up to five centimetres in diameter, but they might grow toward, to, um, particularly in the instances of the, uh, the columnar stromatolites, up to about 30 centimetres. Uh, <clears throat> in the leeward environment, so we're still on the reef flat, but we're in the lower energy or more tidally dominated environment on the back of the reef flat, 
again, the stromatolite form becomes much more compressed and um, is dominated more by digitate and pseudocolumnar stromatolites. So you can see the scale of these, um, these forms are much smaller. Um, so this is sort of kind of a plan to oblique view and this is, sorry, uh, cross-sectional to oblique view and this is a plan view of the sorts of uh, stromatolites we find in that environment. Um, and then into the uh, Back Reef Lagoonal Association, this is a bit of a mixture of uh, fasces, which are, um, include mechanically abraded and redeposited uh, grain stones, forming cross-bedded um, grain stones, uh, and as well as microbial, thick microbial beds, my microbialite beds that form patch reefs, and um, sporadic poorly developed pseudocolumnar stromatolites that we also see within, associated with the microbialites. Am I short on time? Um, yeah, can you, can you uh, nope, but you want, can I, oh, I can go pretty quickly. <laughs> okay, so um, reef or fabrics can be characterised more genetically by the role that they play in reef growth. And for example, um, this classification by Embry and Cloven um, is used in the Phanerozoic reefs in which they associate reef, reef fabrics with um, their roles, the roles that they play on the reef. And I think the interest, the point I'm trying to make um, in this instance is that it's possible to look to identify analogous um, fabrics in these reefs, which are um, analogous to those of the Phanerozoic, but, but they're being produced by pro prokaryote in a prokaryote dominated environment. Um, so we see things such as um, bind stones represented by the microbial bound stones, the frame stones represented by those domal stromatolites, and the baffle stones um, are represented by the branching columnar and digitate stromatolites. So in summary, so stromatolites occur in a range of forms across the reef and they respond um, to reef, uh, and they're a response to reef environment, uh, different um, reef sub-environments. Um, in the self-modifying reef system, these different stromatolite forms play different roles in, um, in reef dynamics, much like the range of reef bioconstructors in, in uh, Phanerozoic reefs. Both the range of the forms and the geomorphological and architectural elements of the Arcarula reef are analogous to contemporary coral reefs, despite the distinctly different um, organisms that are involved. Um, and I think an example that was given to me is that the difference is probably equivalent. The equivalent difference in an evolutionary sense is that of between yourself and your gut flora. So that's how different they are, yet they're forming and producing really analogous structures. One other a further point is that um, the reefs demonstrate the, a profound biotic resilience um, because they developed and flourished in a post-snowball earth. So... The Arcarula Reef gives us a unique window into the role of stromatolites as Precambrian reef bioconstructors and geomorphological engineers. They offer an opportunity because of the diversity of the sub-environments for us to really try and investigate this question about evolution versus um, environment when we're looking at stromatolites and trying to understand um, what's controlling their morphology. Um, the preservation, the accessibility and the spectacular exposure of these reefs attest to their world-class geological and evolutionary value, and they demonstrate why they deserve recognition and protection afforded by world heritage status. Thanks.